cyclometric complexity. Do not hard put static values. Have either uh, a configuration or use constants for that. So that's on uh, maintainability and modifiability. With that, I hand it over to Janaki Raman. Thank you, Jyoti. Okay, let's uh, try to understand uh, some of the importance of the framework in the play in the first place, and uh, what happens when you don't have uh, a framework. Now, in the absence of a framework, the typical problems that one could force the developers, they are kind of uh, left hanging because they don't know where to get started. Um, so one common pitfall that projects do is that uh, they try to mingle all this together and try to have the developers come up with a design for all these solutions. But uh, there is a big difference when you want to design for a, a functional requirement versus when you want to design it for a highly scalable and configurable non-functional requirement. So the approaches are very different here. So what happens, uh, developers end up tackling this problem at a code level instead of at a design level. And uh, of course, the developers uh, have their own priorities, so they try to kind of address it at a different level. And you also end up having the uh, business functionality spread across all the layers. So instead of taking the layered approach, uh, everybody tries to solve it in the way that they know. And hence, you end up having a code which is like totally messed up. So that, those are the, some of the problems, and and also in respect to the steps involved, um, like they, like I said, they may not be able to know where to start and where to end. So that again um, kind of leaves them in, in the no man's land. And uh, technology, while it has so many options, it's also a problem because then the developers are left with too many choices to decide as to which ones they should adopt and which ones they don't adopt. So individual preferences comes comes into picture. And then the overall uh, project kind of uh, gets again into an inconsistent state. Uh, developers, as we know, they are always under time pressure. Projects are under time pressure. So stepping back and thinking how to solve something in a generic way or in the right way, seeing it from a holistic perspective, is something that uh, is very difficult from their perspective, uh, given the time constraint and the project pressures in hand. And the developers, as I said, uh, everybody has their own level of knowledge. So everybody tries to solve the same problem in their own version of it. So reinventing the same wheel, scenarios like that keeps happening. And the efforts also get duplicated. So overall, from a project uh, management perspective, if you look at one uh, right from estimation, because uh, many times the estimation goes wrong not because of the functionality that is spelled out in the document, but rather um, the implicit requirements that are not spelled out in the document. So like, in a first, as an example. So the effort duplication and the estimation, incorrect estimation, all might lead to uh, delays in the project and adds up to the risks within the project. And also in the absence of a framework, it's going to be extremely difficult to maintain application. So we have seen legacy uh, maintenance of applications being done by a large set of teams. The primary reason being that uh, there is no uh, standard way of interpreting those applications, no standard way of controlling or changing things. So even when you want to do a small change, for example, the way you deal with security or the way you deal with a certain uh, implementation, then you have to kind of do it across the product in several places. So you need to first find out which all places have to be changed. Because if you miss out one place, then again, that's going to be a, an issue from a quality perspective. So you end up, you spend a lot of time managing the change rather than implementing the change itself. So what is a framework? A framework is a, a reusable software platform which can be used to develop several applications, products, and solutions. 
and they are designed to facilitate the development process by allowing the designers which is the architects to design the solution from a holistic perspective and then allow the programmers to consume the design and try to build their solutions using that. So it, in a sense it allows the developers to focus really on their core job which is developing the functionality rather than trying to work on this value added set of things. So what are the advantages from a framework perspective? Um, so one, to summarize, focus on the business value, freeing up organizations from supporting high cost and custom solutions. That is one big advantage. And since you are going to be more focused on developing the functionality, you will be reaching the market much faster, faster time to market. And uh, the time required to implement the solution itself is going to be less because you already have the base in place. Also rapid and easy implementation, which could be the, the reduced initial project implementation requirements. And reusability of the code that has been already pre-built and pre-tested. So when you go for a framework approach, you already have the code available, the framework available and taking care of most of the things. So you could take it up as it is, you need not, it's already proven, time tested, so you don't have to worry about dealing with the framework but rather the functionality. And more importantly, you can establish uh, good programming practices, um, establish consistency and standardization across um, the organization. Like if you are planning to build silos of application, for example, uh, enterprise planning to build, um, they sometimes enterprises build like tens and twenties of applications. So when you have a framework uh, as a base and then you start building silos of application on top of it, controlling these applications becomes much, much easier. And the entire uh, silos, the 20 or 30, 40 applications can be embedded on the same platform, which means controlling them access perspective, uh, settings perspective, everything becomes much, much easier. And the overall cost is also pretty lower uh, with the minimized risk in place. So we did also see this slide in the initial uh, first session. So basically the, the commonality of requirements between the disparate applications, right? So as we saw, the domain requirement, of course, is going to be different, but then other than that, the adjoining requirements, which is the user management, security access control, and the runtime quality requirements like performance, response time of the system, and the maintainability of the application itself down the line, how easy it is to change things and maintain, right? So those three things, uh, there is a huge percentage of overlapping between the requirements from one product to another product uh, between applications. So when you, what we are trying to do here is from a framework perspective, trying to package or bundle these three together in such a way that um, all the applications and products can leverage this requirement and can make use of it. So the uh, advantages in this case are primarily around uh, one, the technology standardization. So you set across the technology stack for your own um, IT or the product so that uh, it's not left to the developers or for the individual to decide whether I should use a silver light or whether I should use a MVC. So everything is now set. And you, you don't have to really break your head in seeing what is good or bad. So technology standardization is one big advantage. Of course, the cost, decrease in cost, um, can be achieved because you you're not trying to do the same things again and again you're saving cost and then you also have developers who are trained on this framework which means they get to know how to use consume this framework and how to build solutions on top of it and uh, tested and proven framework is always better from a project management perspective from an reducing the technical risks involved in completing the project successfully this is a typical SAS framework. Um, so this is more from a reference perspective you've given, um, which could give you an idea of the various kind of things that the framework should contain. So this, this, there are different flavors of this framework, and what we have taken is a, a SAS framework, for this example, because we, we also talked about multi-tenancy and a few other things. So primarily, uh, three things that constitute uh, the framework. One 
the uh, plumbing stack itself which provides all the basic plumbing layers um, like a distributed caching or the way you handle exceptions, how you keep track of logging, audit trail kind of uh, functionalities. So these are small in nature but then are very important because uh, this put together provides you the base um, standards that will have to be put in place. And then on the engineering stack, you might have a, a set of components, libraries, um, a set of features which all are controlled under the multi-tenancy context. So you may have multi-tenancy support and within multi-tenancy you may also support uh, hierarchical tenant and you might support uh, various tenant configuration settings, templates and also the customizability uh, aspect of it because each of these modules uh, can be further customized, can be further tweaked as to how it should work for a given tenant. So the customizability settings will also have to be uh, applicable. Um, so some of the key uh, modules that could really be useful, um, particularly in, in a SaaS framework kind of scenario, one is a, a business rule builder. Like we saw, um, like Jyoti mentioned, there are scenarios where you will have to write different pieces of code for different clients. And uh, instead of writing it with a simple if condition or trying to multi maintain multiple versions of the code, multiple pages, multiple libraries, uh, business rule kind of uh, module will allow you to define these various business logic against a particular tenant and you can tag them with a certain name. For example, sales commission could be one business rule. So you can go ahead and define what, how the sales commission should be uh, calculated and this is done and stored at a tenant specific level. So which means uh, it, you, you have a very nice way to go ahead and define all these varying uh, business rules or logics through a nice editor, an intuitive editor, which also means that uh, it need not be the technical person who is going to be doing the changes, but instead a business user or say a in, in level one kind of non-technical user can also go ahead and use this UI and change it according to the request from the user. So in essence, if you could imagine it again saves a lot of time from a developer perspective, they need not worry about it. So where they want to calculate this sales commission, all they have to do is invoke this business rule called sales commission and then the rest of the things automatically gets calculated depending on the settings that are done for that particular tenant. So similarly, workflow is one another module where you want to orchestrate a series of tasks where the tasks could either be automated tasks or manual intervention tasks. It could be a simple leave management approval system, purchase order approval. Um, we are not talking about complete BPM here, but just the workflow part of it. BPM is much more a bigger um, uh, product in, in first place. So workflow, um, trying to help you from an, again from a multi-tenancy perspective, can define multiple steps or various different steps for different tenants, so that uh, you, you can again address their varying requirements in a much more organized way. The query and report builder could be another handy uh, module which could be leveraged to create ad hoc reports. Um, so you, your product might already contain a set of out of box reports um, predefined, but then there is also this um, uh, need for customers to on the fly generate some data, right? depending on whatever their need arises. Suddenly they may want to put together a different combination of uh, data and they want to take a report out of it. So usually it comes to the um, implementation, the support team to uh, get to be processed but then uh, having this module available kind of self service of the customer uh, so they can go ahead and directly create reports out of it. Configurable UI, uh, we saw the need for having a custom field kind of scenario where one customer might want to add extra fields to an existing entity and uh, another customer might want to remove some of the core fields that are already in the product. So configurable UI provides you that advantage. So there are uh, several such uh, modules that are uh, possible. So you're just touching base, touch base on the important ones. Uh, roles and right management, user management, again, the combination of it allow, allowing you to define the granular level of security settings that are applicable for a user. And some interesting modules like data scope management could also be useful where uh, the accessibility of a data is not just controlled by the um, settings of the permissions, but also the, the relationship of the user against the data. 
a simple example could be um, a manager should be able to approve the leaves but then he should be able to approve leaves only for those employees that are reporting to the manager. So we are talking about the, not just the permission of approving leave but then approving it only on certain records and the records here are determined by a certain relationship with the current user who is operating it. So in this case the manager when he logs in should be able to operate this particular action only on the records that satisfy the event relationship. So this com this kind of scenario could, could be dealt in n number of ways. So it could be manager or it could be for example peers when I do a, a 350 a 360 degree feedback I should be able to rate only my peers but I cannot rate my superiors for example this is another example. So there could be so many combinations that can come in but then again all of this if you think through uh, reduces the complexity from a developer perspective. So developers need not break through their head and it's already done available and ready to be used. So the engineering stack contains uh, mostly of this uh, items of this nature and then you have the, the SAS operational components which uh, deals with managing the SAS product right so managing from an operational perspective. So you have things like tenant provisioning where you can manage your tenants, add new tenants and uh, set their access control, create the packages that are required for them, packages determine what modules are available, what features are available for a given tenant and uh, you could also have authentication related modules which will determine how the authentication should happen, that a single sign on should be in the place, in the, should be the way of authentication. And you can also have licensing and metering services uh, which will define the uh, accessibility and usage of uh, the product or application by the tenant and the set of configuration services. So uh, this is an, uh, a guideline of what a typical SaaS framework contains and in each one can expand to a greater extent um, but then again depending on how much you need for your product uh, you will have to go ahead and design it. or adopt a framework that has these features in the first place. So with that we will quickly move into the case studies section. We have